There he is. Mr. Trevor Godinho. Good afternoon, yeah. sir. Hey, how are you doing? Thank you for having oh, me. My pleasure. This is a, a great way to end the week. It's always a oh. pleasure to chat with you. I know it's it's a unique way of chatting. I'm, I'm so used to seeing you in person over a beer or That's right. scotch. Well, this, is, this is different. Yeah. You got coffee, I got a glass of water. This I, is definitely different. I know, different. we should have just kept with the theme and had scotches. But uh, <laughs> and maybe, maybe in a couple hours if we're doing this, the, the late night edition. Uh, oh, definitely. <laughs> Um, so I want to give everyone watching a sense of kind of what they're in for today. Um, we're really focusing on composition. Now, you're an editorial photographer. Uh, you've mm -hmm. had an incredible amount of success in the years that you've been doing this. Uh, you know, your work has featured so many celebrities. Uh, you've been on many beaches with many models in many bikinis. <laughs> Um, and a lot of that has been published worldwide. So, you know, the depth of the experience that you've had really crosses so many boundaries. I mean, now you're even working with veterans. That's a big project for you. And so yeah. the idea of composition, the idea of how we look at a frame and we decide what goes where um, and, and how do we build interest in the frame, how do we draw the eye around this is something that you've had to continually consider across a lot of different, um, I would say, genres of photography in the sense yeah. within the human element. Um, and it also changes with platforms as well, like if it's medium format, 35 mil, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and it changes based on how we're viewing it, whether we're viewing it in a magazine, whether we're viewing it on Instagram or however, right? So. Um, what we're going to talk about today and what I was really eager to chat with you about was this idea of um, how do we build sort of a, I don't want to say a checklist, I don't want to sort of dial it down to that, but this idea of how can we look at a frame and what are the thoughts that can go through our head to go, how do I make this more interesting? How, what are the elements that I'm looking for every time I'm taking a frame, whether it's a picture of my uncle or whether it's a house or whatever it's going to be? Um, so we're going to get into all that, but what I always love to do first is have you tell the audience your story, kind of how you got started in photography and where, what brought you to sort of where you are today. So I'm going to hand over to you now and drink my tea. So, so my background, very few people do know about that is that I'm an artist. I actually start, traditionally started as a fine artist, so painting, sculpture, drawing, got into animation for a short while. So I always understood how you put something in a frame and then eventually about 15 maybe 15 20 years ago I started shooting um first was mostly to get images for my paintings because I like to use images for as references and then eventually I ended up shooting a girl who I knew who was who ended up being published in Maxim United States and at that time me not knowing what that was I'm like sure whatever um I eventually got a couple of gigs with Playboy, ended up shooting with them till that kind of got kind of old for me. I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, I ended up doing a few odd things here and there, shot some commercial work, so stuff for Mitsubishi, shot some stuff for Your Plate Yogurt, huge difference. <laughs> and then I uh, ended up um, being invited to photograph Michael Douglas. And uh, when I shot Michael Douglas for the first time, it made me realize I wanted to do this because it allowed me to tell someone's story. Yes, he was a celebrity, but it was more than just a celebrity. I was learning how to hear someone's story and then eventually be able to have it bleed through the work. And also, so when you look at the work, you could see the experience. So um, that's where the impetus started for me to move from shooting commercial and somewhat more on the men's style, men's magazine style editorial into more celebrity portraiture and that which led me to the military project I'm working on now. And how would you describe your personal style? Because sometimes, especially with celebrities, you're really just there to like, if, especially if they're on a, a media junket or whatever, like you're just there to capture the moment. And sometimes I feel like a lot of those photographers don't get a chance to really embed their style. They're not taking the celebrity out into the world. 
Um, yeah. in, the, in many cases you are, like I can see a lot of your shots with celebrities on vacation or on location, but how would you, de- because you've crossed so many genres of portraiture, how would you define your style to, to you? What makes a Trevor Godinho photo? So to begin with, um, do a little disclaimer, technically I'm not sound when it comes to photography. Um, <laughs> I you, the photographer you know what, every afterwards. photographer says that, by the way, I just want to let you know. So I don't really care about, as much as I, I do teach, by the way, here's a, uh, here's a plug for you for change is a nonprofit I do teach at, which is an amazing program, which I'm in. Uh, so the thing is, um, what I teach my students is that, yes, it's great that you can learn photography and you learn how the camera works, aperture, shutter speed, uh, ISO, direction of the lights coming. But there's more than just learning about the machine you're using. It's about being able to see what you're seeing and capture it for what you wanted to say. Uh, just because it's not the perfect exposure, which is the quote-unquote perfect exposure doesn't mean it's not the perfect shot. Sometimes an underexposed shot is better than a perfectly exposed shot. Same thing with an overexposed shot is better than a regular shot. So it all comes down to creativity, and that's where my main style comes from. I tend to kind of bleed uh, aspects of street photography, so kind of spontaneity, or I can't pronounce the word today, Uh, a bit of that. And a bit of, I kind of understand what I want to shoot. So I'm shooting with atten- intention as well. I, roughly going into anything, I kind of have an idea of what I want to create. And then let thing, I start there and let things just transform naturally and evolve. Uh, they always say if you're trying to capture a person, the first couple of shots may seem kind of artificial until they relax and then you get that magic shot is because then they've let their guard down. My aim is spend more time talking with them and then I just get one, two, maybe four shots in and one of those shots is a good one because the thing is they got so comfortable with me they forget there's a camera in the room. Mm. I've heard that a lot. I've heard, you know, that portraiture is really all about connection between you and the subject and if your subject is relaxed, if they trust you, uh, the... The, you know, their ability to emote, their ability to give you what you want uh, is so much easier. Um, and that makes me think, okay, like, so the preparation for you is spending the time with that model or spending the time with that actor or actress um, or uh, war veteran or whatever, the, whoever the subject may be. Um, and so that they get to a place where they're, you know, really like you and they really connect with you. And then it's just a matter of, you know, a couple clicks. So there's that preparation there, but there is there also preparation in your mind? I mean, we're going to really get into this later, but when it comes to composition, like, do you walk into a space and go, okay, let me think through the composition in this space first, or do you have ideas even before you walk into that space about how you know you want to frame them within the frame, or does that kind of happen organically and then you just have all these sort of things in the back of your mind that just click for you. And so once you're looking around with them in the shot, you're like, oh, okay, I need to place them here. That needs to be there. How's that process for you? How much happens in pre-production? How much happens when you start shooting? If it's something, if a space I already know I'm shooting in, I kind of know how I want to shoot it. If you walk into a space, let's say for film festival, you end up may be sent to a space to photograph someone. You may end up having a hotel room or you may get a closet. So based on how much space you have, composition has to evolve. It's great you may have ideas how you want to do it, but when you until you actually get there and see what constraints you have, everything still has to be very fluid. You have to be able to think, have multiple A, Bs, and Cs planned out. In the case you can't do A, you have an option. Mm. Uh, plus also when you shoot so much and – Like I always tell my students, photography is like exercise. You're building the muscle. Mm. So the thing is you, if let's say if you have 10 years of photography, two years of photography, you have that amount of time of knowledge that is stored in your brain that you're just pulling index cards and saying, okay, I have this situation, pull the index card, this is the situation, this is how I'm gonna handle it. You're you're literally building a library from every shoot you ever do. Um, And, when it comes to celebrities, 
because what I've always heard with like high profile people, whether they're sports figures or otherwise, is that they don't, you don't have a lot of time with them. So you, you don't really have that time to, you know, if Coco Rocha walks, uh, um, walks in that you're, you don't have an hour to like befriend them. Uh, you yeah. got five minutes. So in those particular situ situations, how much prep time do you have in this space? How do you take that five minutes, befriend them in five minutes, get the shots you need, consider like composition? How do, how do you deal with all that? So be it a celebrity or just any person coming off the street, it's the same thing. It's like, if you don't, if you aren't able to communicate, you're going to have a wall, no matter if it's a celebrity who has really tight security or if it's just anyone. The thing is, Number one thing, you have a short amount of time to communicate exactly what you want to do, what you want to get from them, and it's it's pretty much like ballroom dancing. You, someone is leading and the other person's following, but they have to trust you to follow. Right. Um, this is a bit of a non sequitur, but I, it's it's one that you know everyone's really interested in most of the time, and so I always try to make a point to cover it. And we are a store; we sell all these things that photographers <laughs> use. So I feel somewhat uh, plug. to talk about <laughs> a, a equipment. Um, but you and I have had a lot of discussions about equipment and uh, despite, you know, this idea that you're not that technical, which is not true. Um, <laughs> uh, so quickly give us a bit of a rundown. Um, I actually got a question that's popping in here. So we're going to get to uh, our first question in a second here. But Give us a quick rundown of some of the, your core instruments that you're using in terms of photography, lighting, a camera, and sort of why you've chosen those and okay. how they've helped you kind of create the photography that is important to you. Okay, so to begin with, I'm old. So I started shooting film when digital was like really expensive. So when I got to shooting like photography, I shot 35 millimeter film. I actually started my dad's old camera and then evolved into picking up a Minolta Maxim 7, which I still have today and still use. And then eventually I moved into digital. I shoot with a Nikon D4. Um, I mainly shoot with prime lenses. So 35, 50 and 85 millimeter lenses are my go-to kit. Um, I shoot medium format now. I uh, kind of wanted to slow down because when you shoot when I was shooting on the the D4, I was shooting models and stuff. And then you're moving really fast. But then I realized something, I needed to start thinking again. So moving into a medium format allowed me to think more and shoot less. So there's a lot more brain power and creativity that I was pushing into that 6x7 or 6x6 six six frame. Um, eventually, my aim is to go to 8x10 so that's going to be uh, even slower. That's like that's like a snail's pace. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to my lighting, I'm, most people know I'm the Ellen Chrome ambassador. So um, got to plug some Ellen Chrome. So um, lighting wise, I use the ELB 400s. That I actually shrunk my kit a lot. So the ELB 400s allows me to travel a super light, toss them in my luggage, and they could fl I could fly with them. Um, my soft boxes are all Rotolux. There's a 100 octo, then there's the 120 octo, and then there's a 100 by 100 um, soft box. Um, then I have two see through, shoot through umbrellas out of 100 uh, cm, um, which are great because for really tight spaces, it can light up the room. Only thing with you have a lot more spill when you use the umbrellas. Then bring you bringing flags and stuff for like that it kind of helps you control that but that's pretty much my equipment i i sometimes uh, call vistec to grab a hold of an elb 1200 when i need the extra power one thing i love about the elbs is that especially the new series compared to the old quadro kits they have high sync yeah. which allows you to do some really cool stuff when you're shooting outdoors so you're not restricted by the 200th of a second or the 250th of a second flash ratio that your cameras used to have. Right. There's as much technical as you're going to get from me, okay? <laughs> Perfect. I won't ask any more of you. 
<laughs> All right, so let's get to this topic of, of, of composition. Uh, I did want to address the question that we got from Trevor um, and, or sorry, from Tony. My, my apologies, Tony. Um, and we did address a bit of that, um, which is uh, Tony was asking, what equipment would you use? Uh, and you definitely uh, address some of that. But he also had a specific question about lighting your subject. So I think we're going to get into that, Anthony. Um, so hang tight because I think that's going to come a little further along. We'll get to that. Um, in the meantime, let's start down this path of talking about composition. Now, set it up for us. Okay. Why is composition important? Is it a matter of the, how humans um, think about aesthetics or does it serve a storytelling purpose or both? For you, how do you describe the importance of composition? So when you read a book, depending which part of the world you are, you read right to left or left to right, depending, like I said, which part of the world you are. And which, if you're speaking Arabic, you're reading the opposite way. So the thing is, an image is read similar as reading a book. You need to know the process. And good image creators, and especially fine artists, comes from like painting, sculpture, architecture. They have a way of using lines which are invisible to us, but subconsciously we put two and two together and our eyes start following from one end to the subject that they intend you to see. Uh, these are compositional devices that have been around for thousands of years, all the way down to the Egyptians. They used compositional devices in their hieroglyphs. So I think um, it's innately our nature to be able to be looking for composition. That's why if you look at the new iPhone, the back with the camera, the three cameras, everyone was kind of thrown off by it because it did not see compositionally proper in your mind. So we are built for composition. So being a good image maker is an understanding of that language, that visual language, and how to use it properly to articulate your idea, but also be able to not scare people <laughs> with like multiple uh, cameras. Um, and what happens when we get it wrong? So when we get it wrong, people are a bit confused of what they're either seeing. There's a lot, there's a, there's, there's, there's a part where chaos is okay, mm. but there has to be organized chaos. Right. There has to be chaos with intention. Because what happens if you put a bright color over here and a bright color over here, but your subject is dark in the corner, your eyes are going to move around in some weird ways. It may see your subject, but it's automatically going to be drawn to the brightest or the darkest. And that's what you're trying to figure out. How do you create that balance in the image? Right. So I know that you were talking about how, you know, throughout history and, you know, antiquity and in art, you know, we've always considered uh, composition. Um, and you being a fine artist originally, this is obviously something that you know a lot about. Um, and earlier, before, you know, before we started this live stream, you, know, you and I were talking about classical art and how we can pull examples from classical art. Um, and I know that you have some samples with you. So can you take us through yeah. some of these samples about how classical art uh, teaches us how to be better compositional artists with our photography? Yeah, definitely. So um, the first image, the first image as, you can see, as you can see, is, is one point perspective. One, point perspective. Uh, uh, one, perspective, one perspective, perspective, as you can see, see, this this was before was before I was fine by fine for myself. For myself, I love the Renaissance, Renaissance and Baroque, and Baroque art. art. So uh, so um, you could literally you could literally see what's happening. What's happening. There's, there's, there's couple a couple of different, of different things happening in this image, and if and you can see the you can see the mouse, right? So so. First, you see First one you point. See one point you see this door, you see right, this door here. right there. That's your one, That's point. Your one point on the horizon. So you have a horizon, so you have a horizon line, line, and you have all, all these lines automatically, automatically going to one, to point, one which point, which is right there. Is right there. Then you have then you have these triangles, these triangles this way, which is also one point perspective from the corners, bringing it to the same point. So your eyes, no matter where it looks, is always being brought to the background. But then at the same time, you have mid ground, which is create causing to create three-dimensional reality to an image. Then you have the foreground of what's actually happening. So you have a, a lot of lightness up here, and then you have this heavy weighting down here, which all these lines automatically bring you back and forth throughout the image and allows your eyes to actually take in what's happening here, what's happening here, what's happening here, and then brings you back to what's going on here where I think it looks like Jesus is handing uh, St. Peter the keys to Rome. 
and the Catholic Church. Cool. Um, I know that you got a couple more. Do you want to take us through them? Yeah, we'll go. We'll take you through this one. This is another one. This is Raising of Lazarus. There's a, as you know, the Renaissance is full of religious pictures. So there's two. If you look at this picture carefully, you'll see multiple triangles. There's one year at the bottom. There's one year with the people. There's actually one year with the set. And then there's one coming from Jesus pointing across back to this gentleman right here. So, and right here is a triangle. Right here is a triangle. So these are tools that were used as painters to build up a set, like their painting and their placement of characters, but also to create depth, also to have, to automatically make sure your eyes travel to the point where it needs to go. Also, you notice that this gentleman here is the brightest figure, and the blue and the red brings your eyes up here, and then you follow the hand straight to this guy. So it, even with the hands, are, it's almost creating an indivisible line that your mind jumps from here to these hands, and then you flow around. So a uh, quick question about all this, because, you know, this is a painting where they had yeah. a lot of time to contemplate all of this subtle and subliminal geometric shapes and leading lines. But when we have to take photographs, we don't always get that. I mean, certainly we can set, you mm -hmm. know, like still life kind of stuff up yeah. where we can really art direct it. But a lot of photography, I would say like the most, you know, the, the greater majority of photography happens sort of in an instant. So yeah. are there, I mean, I've got a question for you, you know, after we're done this segment, just talking about, you know, give us that list of things we're looking for, you know, whether it's yeah. rule of thirds or whatever those things are. And maybe geometric shapes is one of those things, but yeah. how can we look at something like this and go, okay, I see the hand in a leading line that's, you know, driving us towards the center. I see these triangles. When you're walking out on the street, are you looking around for the way that you know the light is crossing that happens to match the way a building's roof is coming at another direct like are you looking for geometric shapes as you're walking so, around? to ask that question at first when i started shooting no but as i started looking at fine art and looking at other mediums like graph design is another place that used great composition um i started saying if that works in that two-dimensional form and what I'm doing is taking a three-dimensional scene and making it two-dimensional it should apply mm. so by studying it and then trying to implement them and then like everything comes with practice now I subconsciously see it mm. without even having to think about it so automatically like sometimes when I don't have the camera and I'm kind of annoyed with myself and I don't is that I see the image as I want to compose it I almost see it in a frame mm. And I could, and I knew this has happened the last time we, we met up and you were stand, sitting somewhere in a bar and the way the light was hitting you, I'm like, oh my God, the light hits you at this angle and this, and the, the grading on the wall. And it just automatically starts, your mind starts working because it's like I said in originally, it's like you have an entire library of imagery that you've studied or created that you're pulling samples from. And then eventually that becomes so subconscious. It's like breathing. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's sit, let's go through a few more of these examples. Okay, so we'll go to my favorite uh, artist, Caravaggio. Um, this is a conversion of uh, Saint Paul, where the story is he fell off his horse by seeing God. But if you look at this picture, yes, it looks like he's like raising his hands to the heavens. But there's an actual reason why he's doing. It. Can you tell me why? Um, I am just considering sort of leading lines i mean bingo yeah that's the leading lines and using color right using the, even the leg of the horse how the, why is the leg of the horse brighter than every the rest of the horse there's a reason for that because it brings you trails you back down to the subject mm. even his arms are bright on the inside because your eyes automatically follow those lines in if you literally wanted to follow the lines up the arms to the legs through the body, through the head, and back. That's a circle. Hmm. So the way Caravaggio designed this, he wants you, his, he are, he's training you how to, to view his work. That's what photographers do as well. Like if you look at work by uh, Steve McCurry, you may look at Steve McCurry's work and you'll be like, oh my God, it's a beautiful picture. But when you really sit there and contemplate it, you're like, holy crap. There's so much compositional skills that's involved. And if you ever see how he works, he's so spontaneous when he's shooting that you're like, how do you do that? 
But it's just the same thing. It's the muscle he's been working on for so many years that it just naturally innately comes. Right. It might even but, be, you know, with posing, if you're working with models, for example, or even just some regular people, like just how they stand and how they might put an arm out might inform the rest of the space that they're in. They might be like in a Bingo. circular chair and they're just continuing the line of the chair, you know, that kind of thing. And and that's if you look at great photographers, they do that. There's a Arthur, I think it's uh, Arnold Newman, amazing portrait photographer. Hmm. He he built his career literally thinking about where he places the subject. Hmm. His work has this, is even though it's two dimensional, has a three dimensionality to it because the way he placed the subjects, he could do it like everyone else does. But he decided to say, okay, if I see it at this angle, how can I make this interesting? Let me move five inches this way. How does that affect the image? Mm. How does, if I take three feet this to the left or the right, how does that affect the image? What makes this image more interesting? There's a picture of, uh, I forgot who it is, but there's a picture he has taken where the guy is sitting on a piano. Anyone would have taken it the normal way of a guy on a piano, like the, the piano behind him, but he took it from the side point. So it, literally the gentleman who's sitting becomes the upward, and then you see the top of the grand piano goes down to a triangle and you automatically are viewing that as a triangle and it's just a brilliantly placed shot. And you could say that he never thought about it, but when you look at his contact sheets, you're like, you could tell that there was some thought process about how he composed the shot. Mm, very cool. Um, all right, so let's move on to modern day and photography. <laughs> um, and obviously <laughs> you have some examples as well that you can, um, uh, you know, talk about your particular experience with certain phot photographs and how you compose them. But let's let's tackle that laundry list now. Let's talk about, okay. you know, if we're if we've got a checkbox, what are we looking for? What are the things? Let's take it from the basics. So people who might be tuning in may know very little about composition within right. photography. So let's address their concerns and needs, but also up to the people who might have been doing this for decades who just want some new ideas about how to present uh, composition. So take us through it. I'm going to shut up now. Okay. Ah, uh, it's okay. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> so let's go. We'll start. So the images I'm showing are stuff I've shot throughout my 15-year career. So this is a gentleman we shot who ended up getting published in Playboy France. Um, he's a DJ out of uh, Paris. The, we only had, this is all shot natural light. This is shot at, I think, 1.8 at like a ridiculous 1.4 at a, what's called fourth of a second. Uh, no breathing, no tripod. This is the shot as it came out of the camera. Hmm. So um, the way I thought about this shot was he wanted to create this image of the next morning, the one night stand next morning, because that's the energy of his music. And he's the rock and roller type. So how do I create that story? but also be able to use it where it's portraiture, but also environmental portraiture, but also allow me to have the viewer flow through the image in a way. If you look at the image, how I've composed it, even with the way the woman is lying, and if you go from the, her head to his head, down to his body and back up again, like right here, there's a full triangle. Even the way the lines are reading, the way, even where the bed is, it's all created to be, to create this three dimensionality. By putting them at the corner of the bed, you have this line and this line bringing you right here. And this also incorporates the rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, really cool. I mean, I, it's funny. I've looked at this photo many, many times. And now that you're mentioning it, I do see how his right shoulder, the angle of his neckline and shoulder really drive dr down to her face. And then where her hands are, that, and the, just the way the light fall off is drives down to his sort of waist. And then, yeah, his but arm also, brings you back up again. That's super but cool. But also we realize the other triangles. Is that this is actually a triangle I noticed after we did the first couple, uh, first couple of shots, that this arm becomes a triangle that points back at him. Yeah. Wow. And that's just something you see in paintings. You see that in, arc, in what's it called, um, graphic design. And it's just starting thinking about those things while you're creating it. Even if you look at the way like the contrast and his pants and everything, why it was shot in black and white compared to color, that all has an a reason for it. Right. Like I know in color, it may not have the same impact because I know the different 
we actually didn't have any strobes. We shot natural light. I threw the lamp at the bottom to create some light in the background to separate the subject from the background. But if this was yellowy light, it may not have the same effect, mm. right? Is there, do you, I mean, I know there's not really a good answer to this, but is there something you could tell somebody about when the right time is to shoot black and white versus color when we're considering composition? The, the thing is, if you want something to look very graphic, like the lighting is very graphic and you, the, and going black and white will only enhance the graphic nature of it and the texture and the mood, go black and white. But if you're shooting, uh, I was listening to Steve Mercury, uh, his masterclass recently, and he was talking about if you're shooting Tibetan monks running on a white like temple, the red in their outfits is part of that story. If you're shooting in India during Holi, the color is part of that story. So taking out the color kind of robs you from what that actual story is, what that subject is. So depending on what your subject matter is and what you want the viewer to read from the image, you have to you have that ability to go black and white or shoot in color and change it in Photoshop later. Then you have both versions. That's true. Well, I guess if you shoot raw, you always have that version, right? You always yeah. have that ability. Yeah. But I think that that's fundamentally, you should know how you're going to present this to the world in the end, because my whole thought process here is that if there are so many colors going on, but the light is great, yeah. shooting black and white allows you to just turn off, you know, you could basically put on the black and white filter on your camera. Uh, you're still going to get the color raw image if you're shooting raw plus JPEG or whatever. But by putting that black and white on, you can stop dealing with color and just focus on how the light falls, right? And, and that... plus also, there's one big thing is that color also, is, using color is a compositional tool. Mm -hmm. So if there's two colors that aren't gelling well compositionally, going black and white kind of neutralizes that effect. Yeah, exactly. All right. And, and that's key. What else you got for so us? So let's go using shadow and lighting. So this is taken in New Orleans. I was on vacation, but I don't think any real photographer's on vacation. You're always working. You're always seeing things. So we were in uh, this old building, and right out the window was this chef sitting. And the way I built this image, and it built it subconsciously, or he built the image before I even took the picture. I saw it, and I had to capture it this way. Was that using the shadow and the light? Like if you look at the curtains, the way the light goes through the curtains, it's pointing you directly down to the subject. Having this being a dark uh, interior, like exposing it that way, allows you to see this brightness. Your eyes automatically go down here. You you could fight when you look at this image. You automatically are fighting to look up. Do you feel that way? So a lot, using that compositional, that weight between all that darkness versus the light, and even the ratio of darkness to light in the image, I could have gone at a lower angle and shot the, the, door, uh, the window much higher, but then it wouldn't have the same weight that the higher level of, comp of darkness pushes you down. Mm. And there's a feel of pressure that makes you want to look down. Cool. The next one is... This gentleman, I was shooting an editorial for a magazine about artisan jewelry makers. Using, there's a few things that are using is this mid-ground, foreground, background as a compositional, being out of focus, a foreground, out of focus, background. And then the mid-ground being super sharp automatically clues you into where you want to be looking. Plus also, the luck of the draw is having his fluorescent light light him up that way. Also, allows you to envelope yourself in the image. Even the way I kind of broke the frame by having things climb off the frame allows you to kind of confine your view to the center. This is, normally they say do not put your subjects in the center of the image. There's a few times, depending on how you combine various compositional devices, you could actually you still put someone in the middle and still create a beautiful shot. Very cool. So this image of Al Pacino, which was one of, probably the one of my favorite moments in my career. I love Al Pacino, God, from The Godfather onwards, one of my favorite actors. Um, using this shot, I already had like a few seconds with him, literally. So had him, didn't have too much time to like figure out where we were shoot, whatever, found a white wall, shot him against the white wall, 
the way I place them in the corner, you have this balance between negative positive space. You have all this negative space and him filling out the positive space and also his being black and white, the darkness. It's pretty much a yin and yang kind of yeah. effect. And it allows you to create balance in this image. You could see that he takes up less space than the white. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the, he w still weighs more in the image. So you're automatically looking at him. And there's also a triangle that goes from the top down to the bottom. If you follow his head straight down to his shoulder. Mm. Then you have this shot, which we shot. Was originally started as a fun shoot, which ended up being public, like used by Bell Staff, the motorcycle brand, the clo motorcycle clothing brand, which was pretty cool. I love bringing, I like, I like watching films. So a lot of composition you could actually see in how, the way cinematographers film, mm -hmm. and you you could attest to that. So even placing him like the rule of thirds in this image, use bringing him almost cutting the frame. So he's so close to you also creates the impact of his image. If I actually captured the entire figure with the background, it wouldn't have the same impact, that power, that mood, that mystery that comes with this image. Mm. And I have this addiction of black and white, as you guys could see. And, and, uh, and what we're looking at yep. here, you just, you know, you talked about um, rule of thirds um, and you talked about, you know, that's sort of the uh, bread and butter of, cinematography and the videography is, you know, chopping up your, your camera into thirds. Um, so talk about how you look at thirds, both in a portrait aspect and in the case that you were just showing us there in a landscape aspect, how are you playing with that? Is it just as simple for you as taking that subject and putting them to the left or to the right? Or are you looking or at different aspects of the crosshairs and all that sort of stuff? So I, the way I look at it, I normally am, it's weird that I see it in my head before it's in the camera. So um, I kind of know what I want to say with the image and how I want to place it and where I want to weight the image. Like if I put him on, if I put the subject on, let's say the right side, so on my right, mm -hmm. would be, he would block that, those two tombstones in the distance. And yeah, he'd be, and also where he's placed, he would actually be sitting where the tree is. So you lose the subject's hair in the background. So knowing where you're placing him, you can want to make sure the subject almost has some background that he's not fighting against. Mm. That's what I think about when I think about placement in a shot. Um, even, then I think about everything else. Mostly I'm trying to make sure there's no like light poles showing out of the guy's head. Um, then I, I once I figure that out, I start moving closer. I don't have the subject move too much. I do a lot of moving because I feel the best way to see composition and see the best way to create an impact of image is actually moving around the subject and seeing it from more than one angle, from higher, lower, uh, at eye level, moving to the left, moving to the right. The way you move changes the dynamics of the shot. Mm. And remember, every image is literally a whatever format you're shooting is a rectangle. So there is going to be a horizon line. So I always think where my horizon line is, and if I was drawing invisible one-point perspective or two-point perspective lines, how could I make this image more dynamic? Mm -hmm. If you look at this image here, he could follow arrow right here straight down to this point here, and this point straight down to this point. Mm -hmm. There's a triangle there as well. Yeah. Can, you, can you define one-point perspective or two-point perspective for people who may okay, not know so, what that means? So one-point perspective, so one point perspective, let me go to the first image we I showed you, which is the art one, which is easier. So where the store would be one point. And you see all the lines heading to that point, that's considered one point. Two point perspective would be a point here and a point here and lines going this way and lines going this way. So the object would be a more three dimensional on instead of a flat uh, plane looking at you, you'd see two planes. So let's see if I have an example for that. Okay, let's use this as an example. So this would be two point perspective if this was a drawing. You have this plane can be seen and this plane can be seen. So if you follow this plane, you'd have one point there to that boat and this fault line you'd follow, you'd have a point somewhere around there. So you are not seeing it from its, from its profile. Mm. You're seeing it more of a three quarter shot. Right. What's in, and, um... What are the advantages of, I mean, 
I know a picture is a picture and you're just trying to create certain things. So it's not like you're necessarily going to go out thinking I need to make this a two point perspective. Um, but are you thinking a little about, you know, when you want a single point and when, because my fear is that a two point or three point perspective may also complicate the image and may not yeah. lead the eye where you want it to. So how do we know when we're getting into a situation where we want to add other points of interest? So here's a good example. Uh, if you look at any portraits sh of anything shot in a subway tunnel, mm. that's one point of perspective because it's receding back into a tunnel. I, if I, there are some stuff I've shot in the past which are images of um, people when I was in Italy walking through tunnels and through arcs. And those kind of images, I think there's one on my Instagram um, that actually shows that one point of perspective because everything's receding backwards. When you're shooting, combining subjects, which are like portraits with architecture, that's when you start dealing with two point perspective. You're dealing, the, some things you may have a subject flush portrait to portrait, like, like side profile to side profile of the building. But to create an image more dynamic, you always make it a little bit more three dimensional because you want shadow, shadow creates depth. So when you shoot, you're not really going out thinking for two point perspective. Mm. Two point perspective nest naturally occurs in your work. Right. Um, and when we're trying to, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I find it's easier to tell a story for me because I work as a cinematographer that I always yep. think horizontally and that we're telling a story horizontally. And one of the reasons that we push somebody to the side, not just so that it's aesthetic, but it also informs them because we see them, but we also see the space that they're in. When it's turned to a sort of portrait aspect, I find that's a, a little bit more difficult for me. I find that, you know, to do that, sometimes it's about intentionally leaving lots of headroom mm -hmm. or, you know, photos that just don't feel the same way that they would feel or have the same narrative device that they would when we're, go when we're looking landscape. Um, how are you adjusting all of this when you're shooting portrait versus landscape and trying to tell that story? So that came very hard for me. Uh, I tend to shoot horizontally. And I've, for some reason, I've always shot horizontally for the longest time. I think maybe because it came from paintings, I would always paint horizontally. Um, I had an art director once told me that, you know, remember magazines are two-page spreads. Think rectangular. Mm -hmm. And, th and then flip it fl on its side. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I got so... Because when you're shooting a cover, it's great. It's it's perfectly vertical. But then you go horizontally, you're like, I have more space to play with. And sometimes that when I was younger and as a photographer, that scared me, having so much place to play with. As I got older, I'm like, depending on how I'm shooting, negative space is not a bad thing. Mm. Empty space is not a bad thing. Having, if you could manage your background well for environmental photography, having things that add to the story is not a bad thing. So that's when I started shooting more horizontally. Uh, not, yeah, horizontally. But definitely shooting vertically, for me personally, I would tend to have subjects like the Al Pacino picture more on one side, I've, sometimes in the middle, or I bring them super close, very close up shots of their face, eliminating a lot of the other parts of them, just because then you have more impact when it's really close up, eyes, nose, mouth, expression, and it creates more of a tension between the subject and the viewer because it's up in your face. Um, one of the things that can translate between horizontal and vertical or portrait and landscape is this, and it's a bit controversial because some people say it doesn't matter at all and some people say it has a huge impact, which is the golden ratio, this, 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 the, oh, this sort the of swirl. cocktail <laughs> swirl. I'm going to bring it up on the screen here for people to see if you're not familiar with it. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to bring full screen. Um, so it's basically this. Um, for you, how much of this plays a role in composition? Do you completely disregard this or do you find this to be a useful tool? So when I, in my painting, I used to use it a lot. Uh, 
and like still lifes when i do still lifes now i which i've started to get back to doing still lifes because we're kind of in captivity so i can't shoot anyone so um i'm starting to start shooting some still lifes and i'm thinking about the golden ratio about where i place certain subjects mostly the subjects are bottles of whiskey um but it it's something i have to start thinking about because i kind of forgotten about that rule and like preparing for this talk with you i had to refresh myself on things that i learned when i was in university and when i was in art school and i'm like oh yeah i don't think about that anymore but when i look at my work you could find it in the image and you're not and you're like how did it get there but i think it comes down to like are you, the golden ratio was created because we humanly think that way mm. um what do you mean by we humanly think that way what is it about this ratio what what is it about this swirl that somehow connects us in our the way our humans are like i'm always wonder if is this a social thing that we've been taught or is there this some biological thing that triggers this interest what what we've you been told from a classical perspective so so uh, as if you go back all the way to Neanderthals, when they start doing the first visual images on walls, our genetic n education started there. Mm. So not to get too scientific on anyone, but the thing is we have so much history from the dawn of t like visual language to where we are now that it's been bred into us. So now it's nature. Right. It was. It started with nurturing, and then it became nature because we have such a huge history of humanity. Right. And if you look at any culture, be it the Mayans, the Egyptians, the the Greeks, the Romans, Indians, um, like Renaissance, um, the the Vikings, you'll see these. They're all spread around the world. But why are we still seeing the same kind of compositional visual language? Mm. So the thing is, genetically, from where we started, we were being trained to see this way. Right. And as we were trained to start seeing this way, this became common knowledge. So when we went from writing on the caves to going to paper and canvas to graphic design to photography, that, that two, those devices have just been transported and evolved to a new medium. Mm -hmm. So we're still learning the same thing and we're still absorbing the same thing. It's just a different medium and we're reading it in now. Right. All right. So, like if you look at reading, reading's the same way. Right, exactly. Um, so I'm going to sum up where, where we've come from and we're going to keep going. So we've talked about uh, geometric shapes, leading lines, triangles, single points, multiple points. We've talked about rule of thirds. We've talked about the golden ratio. What else do you got for us? What else do we need to consider? Uh, there's vanishing lines, which pretty much is pretty much looking at triangles, but instead of triangles, we're looking at literally lines that tra traverse through the image. Like I could have photographed this director who, it's funny, he actually passed away a few weeks after I photographed this shot. Uh, and it says, so I guess that's it then. Um, but the way I photographed him, it is a bit of loneliness. It's a bit of pensiveness. There's the weight of the light coming from the window, the dark shadows. Everything about this image makes him seem very serious. But he, because he's a serious, um, his films are very serious. So if I did a straight up portrait of him, it wouldn't lose. It would lose a lot about who his character was. So using these horse, these diagonal lines that go through the table that lead up to him, even if you look at the glasses, they literally form a line mm. to him. Mm. And that creates this sense of loneliness. The, I could have actually cut the table much closer to take the shot, but being so far kind of gives you that slow lead to the subject. And having those lines, your eyes automatically follow to that subject because normally your eyes would be fighting the brightness versus the darkness. Right. Um, I see you have other photos, so I'm going to make you go through them and talk about them. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is, this is the last one I have. Uh, this is shot in New York in the rain. Um, he's another DJ I photographed when I was in New York. And the way I shot this was a very low angle. You could see that one point perspective, but
but where it's the lines are going is somewhere around where this food truck is how where I placed him as well with the light coming from behind him so it separates him from the background there's a lot of thought process in how I shot this shot just because I wanted it to have impact this is an this is an image where the rule of thirds is broken he's dead center in the middle mm-hmm. If you go to any photography school, the, the, your professor first thing will say, never put your image in the your subject in the middle of the frame. But your it works because you have this balance between this negative space and this negative space. You have them in the middle. Even the way the lighting is, the way the trees in the background have this weird compositional frame that brings circles you around. There's a lot of thought that you subconsciously your mind just goes A plus B equals C. And the image works. Hmm. Um, awesome. That's actually one of my favorite photos that you've ever taken. Uh, I remember you know, Thank you. I saw that. It's, it is just the contrast. And uh, you know, I immediately looked where I need to look. Like It was just a very powerful photo. So I think it's a great example of how even just breaking that rule of thirds can work really, really well when you design everything else around it. Um, so let's transition into talking about some of the things and some of the activities that people can do who are looking to up their composition game. They want to consider all of this stuff. Um, I'm going to ask you the question, but I'm going to give a little anecdote first, which is that right. years ago, 20 years ago, when I was or more than 20 years ago when I was a professional musician, I read this book and they talked about how I think it was Mozart or Beethoven in the book became such a prolific and a talented musician because they would practice like an arpeggio, which is like, you know, a series of notes within the chord, the same one over and over and, and their instructor would come and say, uh, you, you know, you're not done yet. And we come back like seven hours later and it's like, am I done? And he's like, no, you're not done yet. You know, like you're going to play the same arpeggio for like two days, you know, that kind of thing. And it seems absolutely ridiculous to do something like that. But the idea behind that and, you know, what we call effortless mastery is building up these uh, uh, files of experience that allow us to not have to articulate consciously the things that we're looking for. So in my mind, and the question I'm going to put to you is, are there activities, are there challenges that photographers can put upon themselves to say, for the next week, I am going to, you know, shoot something that has only one point of interest or, or I'm going to shoot something that only has the person on the left third. Um, or the subject on the left third, whatever that's going to be. What's your advice to your students and to anybody who's wondering about how they can begin to immediately put some of these ideas into practice and begin to internalize them? First off, I thought you would pull out the Bruce Lee. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's called, uh, I fear the man who practices one kick of 10,000 times compared to the guy who knows 10,000 kicks. I've never heard that. That's an amazing, (laughs) amazing line for sure. So, um, one, of the, one of the, actually my students hate me for this one is, and it's something I've been doing for myself. I, I practice this over and over again sometimes. Is that you find an object which no one really cares about, like it's an inanimate object. It doesn't emote anything. It's just a garbage can or a, t- a like mobile phone or something that's inanimate. How could you? look at the image and shoot it in multiple ways, multiple times a day, multiple angles, close up, far away, even like in different like places and see how you're, you're seeing the object changes, how your images that you create actually add to it some sense of emotion. The composition is meant to create helps you create objects into emotion. Look at still life. Still life, you have emotions to still life when you look at it. So practicing these, and then what I would do is say, hey, every week, do 100 pictures of that object. Different ti- different atmospheres, different times of day, different angles, all that stuff. And then do it for a whole month. Then edit your pictures down to the best five. So... When you're looking, you'll see over that month 
that the way you look at the object, the way you place the object, the way you shoot the object completely changes from the start to your finish. Because you start, instead of looking at the object, you start looking, learning to see. Because we start off looking, as a photographer, you start looking at the subject. You're so caught up in the subject that you forget that you're not there to capture the subject. You're there to capture the moment. And that moment can only be captured if you see everything that happens around it. The composition, the lighting, the, the emotion, everything. It feeds together to create an image. You can't have one without the others. They all combine together. So this is... This is an activity that I kind of force my students to do on a regular basis because it keeps your eyes, it exercises the eye, so you're not seeing through the camera, you're seeing through your mind. Mm. You're doing all the thinking because I will always be the one that says photography is 99% in your brain, 1% in the finger. Mm. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, another great thing. You're, you're, you're full of these little idioms today. I love it. Um, uh, before we close off, I, I kind of want to actually go further back to talking about classical uh, art because this is, this is kind of really a personal question for me. This has always been something that's interested me when I travel around the world or even if I just go here uh, you know, to the art gallery here in Toronto. Um, I'm always looking at classical art. I'm always considering these things, but I have to admit that I there's a lot that I actually really don't know. I've never trained as an artist. I've never trained. I've never gone through school and, and looked at art from an academic perspective. And I know that there's probably a ton of really amazing nuggets in there that graphic designers learn, right? They learn about color yeah. theory. They learn about balancing an image. And, um, and you know, if you probably go down the road of becoming a graphic artist, you probably have to learn some, you know, art theory and art history. So for people who, you know, may not have the time to go to art school, <laughs> what kind of resources should they be looking at that will start to teach them about how classical art and how graphic design can influence us? How can we learn from that? So I have my own influences. So I, even though I'm a photographer and I practice and, and your intro was a lot of, got me blushing a bit, but um, I still look at photography and other photographers. Right. I still look at artists because the more you look at art, the more you look at mediums which are not even your own medium, be it film, be it painting, be it graphic design, be it sculpture, architecture, you're learning. So you don't need to go to school for that. You you literally just have to spend the time to look at it and then break it down. Like, you may look at one of my images and see an image, but when you spend a little bit more time with it, you start making connections. You start looking at it. You're like, oh, that makes sense. That I wonder why this works. Why is he off balance? And you start asking questions. The thing is that creates you, helps you to learn is that you start asking questions. Yeah. When you stop asking questions, you stop learning. Right. It's, it's interesting. I, I wonder if there's a parallel there based on what you just said, which is um, for, for folks who listen to podcasts, and uh, there's an amazing episode of Radio Lab where they talk about how uh, when we first hear a melody, we don't particularly like, we had a new song comes on the radio, like, that's ah, okay. But within a week of hearing it on the radio, you're like, this song's awesome, you know? And they go through this whole thing about how they just take a bit of speech saying, Hi, my name is, and then that doesn't sound melodic. Hi, my name is, but then if you just keep repeating, hi, my name is, hi, my name is, hi, you start to notice that it's actually there's melodic in nature to it. There's, there's a melody there's a in our voice, um, yeah. and I see that in what you're saying about whether we're looking at photography or paintings. Is that if we take a quick glance, we don't see it. Maybe our subconscious picks it up, and maybe that's what we like about the photo, but it takes time to look at it and trace around and analyze it to really see what we like about it and what's working and why the composition is the way that it is. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. When, when you go to the, to the AGO or any museum and you always see this, these people just staring at the work and you're like, what are they looking at? I don't see it. But what happens is when you actually practice what they're doing, they start seeing the image not as a flat image, it starts breaking up right. in layers. And as you start breaking the layers down, you start seeing things that you would not see before. Right. Uh, there's, there's a photograph I did a while back and I used it to teach with, let me see, I wonder if I still have it somewhere. Let's see, let me go to my Dropbox and see what's going on.
I'm going to show folks your Instagram site while we uh, while we wait for you to I look for up. this. This is um you know we look at even this is I love this one the Apple Store. Um, yeah. you know it's just in Eaton Center and it's a perfect sort of vanishing line even line. It looks like something out of like Stanley Kubrick 2001, you know, and it's just because it's black and well, it's also because it's Apple, um, you know, and you've got some of the classic uh, Godinho shots there that grace the pages of Maxim. You've got a lot of great celebrities. Okay, let me see. found it. All right. I got your so, screen up now. Take it away. Okay. I'll do you what do you see i still see the same one i still see okay the, uh, so let me let me swap that to the other screen then okay let me close this and then i'll swap it the joys of technology yeah i know <laughs> here we are oh you do you see uh, a street scene and i still see the same guy from new york let's try it again Switch window. What do you see now? Uh, let's try this. There we go. Ding, 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 ding. OK, so if you look at this image, which was shot in Milan, uh, I think in 2014, this, I don't want to rename you. OK, <laughs> uh, this is a, a good example of one point of perspective. But also, but if you look at this image, it's it's architectural, it's portraiture because it's a portrait of this woman in, on the bicycle. But the thing is about, you start looking at this image and the way you look at this image, you start seeing more images. So if I was a painting on the wall and you're staring at it, you start seeing this guy here on the phone in the background. You see this guy looking suspicious in the foreground. You see this boy. And that's what literally studying art and photography and looking at the work you start seeing things that you didn't see when it's all the way the complete image. You have to sometimes zoom in to an image to see what's going on. Hmm. Awesome. Well, that uh, pretty much wraps up our... Oh, I'm going to bring myself back. There we go. Uh, that pretty much wraps up our time. Uh, super awesome conversation. I'm going to leave you with the last word here. Any last thoughts uh, for people watching in terms of just ways they can improve their photography the minute that this live stream is done? I think the best thing, and I, what I, my what's called prescription to anyone is just keep shooting. The more you shoot, the more you train yourself to see, the more you shoot, the more ability to be creative you are. I know right now we're in a really tough situation where you can't really go out as much and you can't photograph people you'd like to shoot. Like I originally was supposed to go to Miami, that got canceled. But the thing is, finding things to shoot, if it's being an inanimate object or someone at home, just keep shooting. That's going to keep you creative. That's going to keep your positive energy up. And then, and by doing it, you start adding compositional devices. And then before you know it, it becomes subconscious to you. Right. Right. And I mean, this might be a great time too, because, you know, if life is, you know, you know, when it gets back to normal, it's all about the fast pace of life. We can't find the time. Uh, we've got all these distractions and maybe we're out in the world and there's this happening and that happening, you know, visually, you know, as we're walking around with a yeah. camera, but being in our home, we're forced to just kind of look at our home and maybe take the time to take some photographs around our home that, we could just start practicing these things. So this might be like a really great opportunity that we might not otherwise have to practice some of these things. And, and you know, watch some YouTube tutorials on uh, classical painting, watch some YouTube tutorials on a bunch of other sort of compositional Watch things. some great movies. Yeah, this is, this is the time to do it, so. Uh, yeah. Watch, oh, it's called um, uh, Blade Runner has great yeah. compositional filming. Absolutely. So thank you so much, my friend. It was a, a pleasure. My pleasure. I hope the next time we talk, we have two scotches in front of us. In the meantime, uh, thank you for your time and have a great weekend. Hey, thank you for having me. My pleasure. You too.